Hi, everybody. Welcome. So during the keynote, you heard a little bit about material design. And we hope to give you a little bit more detail about that today and in the sessions that follow tomorrow. Um, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about our inspiration around material design. Every object in this room owes its origin to a few people throughout the millennia who paid careful attention to their environment. They sought out the very best materials, and they learned their properties, and they used this knowledge to make things. And when you consider making things, the, the design and the manufacture of things, we inherit thousands of years of expertise. Uh, in contrast, uh, relatively, software design is just getting started. Much of interface design concerns itself with what people see. But with modern high-resolution displays coupled with the ability to physically interact with the software, your expectations are much greater. In fact, there's thousands of years of expectations. And so we took a step back. We looked at all of this software and we asked, what is this made of? We challenged ourselves to define the underlying physics of our interfaces and craft a visual language which unifies the classic concepts of good design with a solid understanding of the most fundamental physical properties. At first, we thought like designers. How should it appear? How should it look? But then we thought like scientists. Why does it behave this way? And after many experiments and many observations, we wrote down everything that we'd learned. These are our material principles. Thanks, John. Yeah. Android. Hello. In Android 4.0, Ice Cream Sandwich, we introduced a typographic magazine-style UI. And uh, a lot of people liked it. Uh, we were pretty happy with it. Um, but design is continually evolving. Users are getting more sophisticated. The design landscape is more sophisticated. Um, in particular, motion has become incredibly important over the last few years. We wanted something that was taking the very best of graphic design clarity and the innovations in motion graphics and uh, motion communication, but that still tapped into those elements of tangibility, of physicality that industrial designers themselves use. So this led us to a question of how do we do this? And the very first principle in material design is metaphor which seems a little random. Why metaphor? Metaphor is, a, is basically a very, very short story. And like stories, metaphors are really powerful because they are deep and dense in meaning. They communicate more richly than verbal language can. When I say, if I'm writing a play, if I'm telling you about a character or a person in real life, if I say she was a hurricane, I don't have to tell you about her force of will or her indomitable spirit. I don't have to tell an actor that uh, averting her gaze would be inappropriate. The metaphor is a form of knowledge transfer that depends on shared experience. And in fact, this capacity to transfer knowledge and to transfer learning is one of the things that defines humanity and in fact defines intelligence. So for us, the idea of metaphor is a backstory for the design. It unifies and grounds the design, and it has two functions. It works for our audience. We want to present a metaphor that they can understand, that they can connect with, that they can use to move faster into understanding how to use things. But it's also a metaphor for ourselves. 
for the designers and the developers and the PMs and the QA people and everybody working together. Because when you have a metaphor that everybody understands, intuitively understands, you don't have to explain how they violated subsection C clause two of your style guideline. They just know it feels wrong. They know it's, it's out of place. So why this particular metaphor? Why did we imagine a material that was a form of paper sufficiently advanced as to be indistinguishable from magic? Well, one part of it is, of course, that we do have a lot of experience as humanity communicating with paper. Paper is just rich in a history uh, across all our cultures of conveying information uh, and it naturally uh, affords uh, so many different ways of interacting with it. But the other aspect of paper is that it is a physical thing. It exists in the world. And this idea that surfaces because they're tangible, are a metaphor that we can use to accelerate understanding of our UI is really important. You have this perception of objects and surfaces that's happening in the more primitive parts of your brain. It's happening in, in, the, in these visual cortexes that are in the back and, and lower parts of your brain. Um, and that means they're simply easier than language. They are more natural than language. You have this inherent understanding about the separation of things and the relationships of things that allow us to look at this and have it make sense. Even though we know there is no material in the world that could possibly do this. It is irrational and yet feels completely natural. And that's what we want when we're creating digital magical interfaces, right? Because we are not constrained by the laws of the real world in our user interfaces. Surfaces are intuitive, and that's why we use them as the foundation. They organize space and rationalize the interaction. And it matters that you preserve this inherent sense of what's right. Not for the sake of artifice, but in order to make the mind work less. One of the things you'll discover in our material design documents is that our buttons rise to the surface in response to touch, instead of sinking into a surface like a fake plastic button would. And we do this because we want this illusion to be consistent. The idea that when your finger touches that glass on your phone, that surface is coming up and meeting your finger at the point where it touches. Content is bold, graphic, and intentional. We pushed ourselves when we were thinking about material design to make clear and deliberate design decisions um, regarding color and typography. Um, so embracing these classic visual design principles that John and Matthias have both spoken about um, in our new framework. With Ice Cream Sandwich, Android introduced a new system font, Roboto. And today, we're updating Roboto to go beyond phones and tablets and be the default typeface for the material UI. Here you can see the current version of Roboto. And Roboto is now slightly rounder, friendlier, and most importantly, redrawn to perform on desktop and beyond. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience that it handles really well. We also de uh, developed and uh, documented our design guidelines for typographic scale. By using one typeface and a handful of weights for emphasis, we believe that it delivers you know, a consistent and clear hierarchies in your products. Using scale and appropriate display sizes, you can create dynamic print-like layouts with using white space and contrast. This focuses your users on the content that really matters. 
Using vertical key lines and baseline grids, content is bold, elegant, and graphically clear. We also developed a complete color palette with intentional color decisions for shades, tints, and accent pops. These are not just adding white and black to a color or using alpha. We actually looked at each of these shades and decided what they should be. Um, so strong and intelligent application of color gives life to your UIs, and it connects users with your brand. It also can create very strong hierarchy um, and liven up some pretty standard UIs. Um, as you can see in this example, it's essentially some kind of form that you're filling out, and there's a clear area for your title, and that's what we want people to focus on. Dynamic color is also really exciting. Earlier today, Matthias announced a new API in the L preview called Palette. Um, this system really makes it easy to color things, dynamically select and extract color for use. One of the things that you could use color for is contrast accent colors. Contrast colors make this floating action button, which is this, the play pause button, really pop. Brand, color, and icons are accelerators that guide users through your design. When thinking about app icons, we looked at real life studies in lighting and shadow. We started by defining a universal grid for app icons, one that supports primary geometric shapes. A product icon is the first literal touch point of your user's experience. We looked at extracting those attributes from your icon and from your brand and intelligently applying those to the surfaces within your UI. The top toolbar and the floating action button, again, are accelerators for those actions. Here's just another example of how to connect those surfaces to the product icon. And finally, we took the same modern, bold, geometric approach from app icons and applied it to the UI icons you see in your app. Our design teams are now using one common set of icons between Android L, Polymer, and the web. This means one trash can across all devices, and we'll be releasing these icons later this summer through our design guidelines available for use on both Android and the web. All right, so even, even if we're, we're doing all this and we've got great typography, as an industry, we're leveling up when we start using baseline grids. We've got amazing color. It's not enough just to draw the static states and stop there. We can do more to show people how the states are changing, letting them focus on the content that matters. So when you think about it, almost all state changes in a UI start with user input. And this is why Material UI puts that user input at the center of the animation story. So when I touch the screen, immediately the surface responds. I can see exactly where I touched and the intersection of the object that's responding. This, this does two things. First, it tells people that they've been heard. They feel powerful, they feel like they're in control, apps feel responsive. Second, it confirms to them that, they've, that the UI is gonna do the thing that they expected, that it's working. This animated touch feedback is now built into the platforms for both Android and Polymer, and it's being used by all of the relevant uh, uh, components. So it's not just the immediate touch feedback, though, that's centered on user input. The material itself transforms to bring in new content. And all of this happens on a shared stage. And when I say a shared stage, I'm talking about the environment where this material lives. It's important to know, as we're looking at the material, that it lives in the same scale and in the same space as we do. We're not flying through some imagined space or looking through a window into another world. This material lives in the same scale as the device itself, whether it's in our hand or we're looking at it on our desk. We don't move, the material does to bring the content to us. You can see how this works as transitions organize themselves around the object as it's selected. The material moves, expands to reveal the new content and notice that even as the content transforms in a way that maybe a, a physical material like paper wouldn't, it's still very clear what's happening because of the, the way the material responds to light and the way the shadows are being rendered by the platform. So anim animation is crucial to reinforcing this metaphor that Matthias talked about. 
It's just in the same way that the, the shadow rendering helps us understand what we're looking at, the way that things move give cues about how they work and about their properties. So, for example, the material animations are naturally show continuity from one state to another. When I select an item, it expands to the next state. It doesn't jump cut. It doesn't blink in and out. It moves naturally like a sliding a piece of paper across the table. If we, if we teleport our users from one state to another uh, in a UI, it can be confusing and disorienting when they get to the other side, almost like if we were to be teleported in the real world, if I were to just appear on the stage in front of everybody here, it'd take me a few moments to, to get my bearings. Uh, it's the constraints that are inherent in the material that make it clear for people uh, what can happen and it lets them predict and understand what has happened. So if it makes it easier to understand what's changing, at the same time, it can show us what's important. So since our eyes are naturally drawn to motion, if, if something moves and it's in our field of view, we're gonna see it. Um, it's a really strong tool for us to, to help direct focus. If, if in a, a, a music screen, the player controls are the primary interaction, the animation can point that out. Also, no, even noticing the details, those small things that you might not even notice overtly, like for example, the small slide on the, on the, the, the control uh, slider as it comes in. Wait for it, there it is. Even though people might not notice it overtly, they, they see it and they know how things work without having to think a lot about it. So these guys talked about many of our core principles, uh, primarily the sense of tangible surfaces, which appeal to the primal parts of our minds with dimension and shading. Uh, bold and intentional design, which provides a unified language that allows brand and UI elements to stand out. And meaningful motion, which fuses this design and the surfaces together and gives new affordances and life to UI. What we want to use these for is to create a new unified experience for users. We're surrounded by devices, and people experience our work across all of these different platforms. And that, for that reason, we want to treat every device as a window on the same content. Uh, we want to tailor the form factor so that each one of them has commonalities, but also can be unique. Uh, color, type, and spatial relationships help tie them together. In this example email app, the, the sizes are all related by color and structure, but there's diversity in the overall presentation. The larger ones use cards so that line length is kept reasonable, uh, and the small ones end up being full bleed so they can take advantage of the size of the device. Uh, in this files app, uh, there's a drawer on the side, but on desktop it becomes a persistent element. On tablets, it's a temporary overlay, so it stays out of the way. And on, on phones, it's a persistent UI that you drill into. Uh, in this calendar example, there's more variety between the views, but again, typography and color tie them together so they feel like they're a consistent experience. Immersive imagery also plays a pretty big role. Um, this is something we've seen on mobile where people are doing things full bleed that we actually want to take back to desktop. Uh, it looks great there as well. Um, and in particular, when things used to be sort of full bleed, we now can use things like cards to keep that same sense, even though they're now surrounded by other kinds of content. Beyond the platforms, we also care about uh, working with different disciplines. Um, interaction, motion, visual design, and engineering are often not deeply associated. Um, and so we've been using this material metaphor as a way to bind the different disciplines together and make them more collaborative. Uh, in interaction, the materials reinforce the overall sense of hierarchy. The scrolling and layering give a good sense of how gestures work and, and, and emphasize how the user should focus their attention. Visual design becomes simpler because of this. Uh, the content itself can be very graphic in its hierarchy and rely on dimensionality for higher level structures like toolbars or other elements so they're not considered together. And emotion, emotion is in most ways the most important. Uh, materiality provides a grounding for it. It makes it consistent and intuitive, so it's obeying realistic physics uh, and, then, and speaking better to the user through that. Um, more importantly, it allows motion to be deeply tied into interaction and visual design. Um, we've got sessions tomorrow, and we'll talk a lot more about the interaction between these different elements, uh, starting in the morning with interaction design, and then uh, in the afternoon, visual and motion design. Um, if you're interested in learning more now, you can take a look at the, the initial uh, spec preview that we put up. There's a, probably more than you're interested in seeing in the moment, but you should come by and, and, and listen to the talks. We'll point out the most important parts. Uh, and, and stay in touch with us. We put up a new site for google.com slash design, as well as a plus community, so be sure and follow us there. Um, 
we, we created these principles as a tool for all your future work. We want to inspire and involve your designs and your apps. Um, so in, in addition to these sessions, we'll have a number of design sandbox events. You should come by and talk to us. Um, but thank you for joining us. So uh, we've left time for questions. Uh, and there's actually microphones in the center aisle here. There's two. There's one in the back and there's one up here. So if y'all have any questions about this or design at Google or nobody has any questions. Everybody just wants to play with cardboard. <laughs> By the way, if you've tried the Earth, Google Earth on the cardboard thing, it's just amazing. Here's a question. Um, I, I apologize. I'm a developer, not a designer. So uh -oh. this is a silly question. Um, I like design, though. Um, I see a lot of circles. What's up with the circles? <laughs> uh, I like them. I like them. Just uh, could, you, could you speak about where they're, where they're appropriate, what you see them conveying to the user, stuff like that? Circles. Mm -hmm. I'm, Who's going to take the circle question? Matias takes the circle question. Oh, okay. okay. I'll take the circle question. The um, uh, <laughs> I really would have thought the circle question should have belonged to the to the uh, to the art directors. But <laughs> so one of the, one of the things that the circles provide. Well, there's there's a couple different ways that we're using circles. Um, actually, it's probably good to step back and talk about. Um, one of the ways that we've simplified um, and we've tried to keep very kind of uh, low level and elemental and primal what we're doing in material design is everything is uh, really its most simple and basic geometric shape. So you'll see circles, you'll see squares, you'll see rectangles, you'll see basically divisions of space. So um, when you want to have a contained element, the simplest way to do that is to bring in the circle. Um, so we use the circle because it uh, naturally has contrast to a space that you've divided up and that has blocks of text or areas that have been created by cards or divisions of color. The circle is a great way to draw your eye without motion to those elements that you want to emphasize, whether that is the uh, floating action buttons that are you know, indicating primary actions, or it's the avatars of people that are you know, very important. Um, the circles create rhythms themselves that help you organize and scan through the page, like when we have the multiple messages and email. Um, so the circle, it, what you should think of the circle as is it is a an element, a geometric element, that is a visual design tool like any of the other tools. It, perhaps uh, in a very simplified shape palette, um, stands out. Um, and that is its attribute, that it does stand out. And you want to use it in places where you want to stand out or you want to create rhythms by repeating it. Uh, did you guys want to add yeah, anything I, to that? Yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking about, um, about sort of where a lot of the circles kind of came from and, and kind of how we early, in, in the early days when we were thinking about this. Um, so at the beginning, I talked a little bit about you know, its material principles in the, in the underlying physics. And one of the things that happens with any interface, if you're interacting with it, is you're, you're sort of you're injecting energy, right? There's events that are happening. You're either interacting with it, you're touching the interface. Um, and you're, you're sort of, as, as you're using it, you're injecting energy into the process of things that are happening. And one of the most fundamental things that happens within, within physics is that whenever a signal happens, right, whether it's sound or, or, or light or what have you, it, it propagates in a circle. It propagates from its point of origin, you know, and, and at ideally at the same velocity outwards, right? Um, and that's generally in a sphere, in a, in a constrained depth environment that's going to be in a circle. And so when you see uh, not only the circles in terms of the affordance for, for, for interacting, but, but also as you tap on things and that circle radiates. Um, it's really about uh, you know, just conveying the sense of, of, of the physicality of the energy going into the system and that that's actually your actions are spreading forth into, into communicating with the rest of the things that are on the, on the screen. Next question. Yes. Uh, my question is regarding the form factor. It seems like uh, it's the apps now with the material, you'll be able to design one app, and basically the app will adapt. It will be responsive to the screen size that uh, the app is running on. Is, is this where, where this is going, where with the material, you'll be able to create one code base and be able to run the app on, on any screen size? 
You want to talk to that one, Nicholas? Or um, I? Yeah, so the, there's two sides of this. One is we want to make it as easy as possible to not just reflow to different sizes, but also to tailor the way that we reflow in, in a unique way. So while the, the default platform behavior will do the right thing as far as allowing you to expand things to different sizes, uh, we do want more thought and attention placed on how it should actually accomplish that. Um, beyond that, a lot of these uh, design guidelines are intended to make that much more seamless of a transition, like the, the commonality of iconography and typography, those blend them together uh, even as we introduce more differences. But uh, our prime focus right now is trying to get these things to carry a design across those different form factors. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll be a little uh, more explicit as well. I mean, for starters, we do have two code bases, one whether you're, if you're developing native apps for Android and one if you're developing uh, with Polymer for the web. Um, there are framework components in both apps which will make it easier for you to scale between uh, different screen sizes. Um, but there is a, a lot of intentionality and design thought that needs to go into making some of those decisions. So we, we don't have one automatic system that will take any application and automatically scale it for you to any screen size. Uh, maybe someday. Um, but I think that would actually require intelligence that's pretty close to that of a developer and a designer combined. Um, what we do have here is a design system where you can create a coherent app and use the same design and have very straightforward ways to adapt it if you understand also what the purpose of the app is and what is appropriate for the different screen sizes. And that still requires a human. Cool. Next. Okay. By the way, is, I, I guess uh, all the line is, yeah, OK, great. Okay. Yeah, you're good. You're good. First off, you guys rock. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yep. All right. So I'm a big fan of the animations uh, and giving cues and to the user and everything. But sometimes it could be too much, right? So at what point do you say, you know, if I hit the play button, it's going to go around the screen three times, come back in, and <laughs> pop up? Because some what users on can... every press every single time. <laughs> so sometimes users can see that as a bug or they might it might slow them down to whether, whatever actions they're doing. So were there any concerns around that? And if so, how do you tackle that challenge? Yeah, so I, I think one of the things to know about, this isn't just true of motion design, it's true of design generally, that, that there's a lot that's going on below what people notice. So we don't actually want people all the time thinking about the animations when they're going from one state to another. You know, we, we, we don't want them to say, gee whiz, like, this is, you know, I, I just opened up that email. And again, I, I saw that animation. We want them thinking about the email. And so you know, if, if you apply that standard as you know, do, how much do I want people thinking about the animation themselves, what is it trying to communicate, then you can kind of back it down to the, to the right level. One of the things that we considered consistently throughout this process was how to use the animation to sort of go along with the user's intention. Uh, because when you have touch responses that sort of emanate outwards, it's very easy to hide details in there that reinforce what's happening without feeling like you've added a bunch of animation in there. So what we've, we've gone, we'll go into this a little bit more tomorrow, but uh, having things sort of move counter to the direction the user's doing things, draw attention to them. And if you're going to do so, you should do that intentionally. If you don't want attention to draw, draw onto things, there's places to hide them. And it's, it's really about trying to figure out how you want to balance it and where you want to draw people's attention. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering uh, if you could extrapolate on uh, how you see new forms of input uh, with respect to motion. So uh, in regards to wearable devices, uh, let's say a swipe left and a swipe right uh, with a wristwatch or drawing a circle in, an air, in the air, how would that integrate with the user experience uh, on an app level, let's say, or on your desktop, and how that would sort of integrate? We've been given a design challenge on the fly, yeah. how, to, <laughs> how to design gestural interfaces. Um, um, I think uh, this is, this, a lot of this, I think, goes back to the um, material as a metaphor. And part of what we're trying to do is, you know, you, you go and you watch, um, you, like, you watch some summer blockbuster sci-fi movie, and, and sometimes it can be a little bit of a letdown because they, they set up a bunch of, like, they set up the world in which they're operating, but then they break some principle, right? You know, and mm -hmm. it just kind of falls flat. You're like, why did that happen? Um, and I think part of what we're trying to do with a system like this um, 
is to, is to set up a series of, of sort of a world in which, in which it functions. And ideally, it's, it's grounded enough in the reality that we have here, um, such that you, know, you can bring your intuition of how objects function um, to the system, and, and, and it, it, it fulfills those expectations and hopefully exceeds them. Um, but then maybe we add an additional you know, magical things that can't, you know, we can't quite do yet with physical devices because we're rendering with, with virtual devices. The, the bridging of gesture uh, and, and, and other types of interfaces, uh, to me, is actually just another level of, um, a, you know, it's another additional dimensionality in terms of interaction. So, um, and it's a it's a progression. So when we started with computers, um, we basically had keyboards, right? You know, and and then we, it's like, oh, so eventually we got a mouse, and so like that was like a little bit of interaction, slightly removed. You know, here's here it's happening up here, and I'm I'm, I'm using these things to control it. Um, and then we get all the way now to, to today, where we have. Um, where we have smartphones with, with touchscreen displays, and so now we have this additional dimensionality of being able to physically touch the software, and now we're adding this other layer in, uh, hopefully over time, and hopefully do it right, where we have uh, wearable devices that have you know gyros and stuff. I mean, even the cardboard device actually is really fascinating because it, uh, if you, again, it's really awesome you play with it. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's just like it's track, it's you know basic head tracking and things like that. Um, and so as we continue to sort of add in these uh, the dimensionality of interaction, right, with uh, um, with gestures, um, it, it, it just it makes it, it makes it so much more rich, and so we just want to make sure that we're we're always grounding it into sort of these principles that we set up initially, so that it's always self consistent. You don't get to a moment where you're like, oh, I did this thing, and then it, it, that didn't make sense. I did this, and it, you know, it was it was it was uh, discontinuous with all of the principles that had been set up before it. Um, one of the things that I, I think is really interesting about about this, and, and we'll talk about this more in tomorrow's sessions, is that there's actually a, a fair amount of uh, spectrum, right? There's a, there's, there's a lot of different types of things that can be expressed, both in terms of color and content and, 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 and the animation, uh, that gives you a, a pretty big palette, right? And it still feels like it's part of a system, but it gives you a very large palette, so you can express lots of different things. So I think um, with the addition of wearables, uh, I, I look forward to you know, to seeing how people you know express their uh, their apps and their applications, you know, through these additional different forms, uh, different uh, interface forms, uh, in terms of manipulation. One of the other things that came up as we were doing this first, as we were looking at just desktop and mobile together, was unifying the overall touch feedback through them. So having hover states and tap states all be resolved together, and then. We started to see more and more of these, uh, and, and treating it as energy was a very nice metaphor for us because we were able to look at, look at on touch, these things are going to move outwards. Voice, as you're speaking, you have a similar response to it. Uh, as you use the D-pad on the TV, the, the movement of, of your focus through a UI will be very similar. And one of the things we didn't really touch on, but like tapping between controls um, using a keyboard can have a very similar feel. Of it's like it is your focus moving through space, and then when you like hit enter on something, that, that, that energy blast is very similar to any other mode of input you might do. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Um, so I work for a company where we are both cross-platform, and uh, our mobile apps are not our primary moneymaker. Uh, so when it comes to time uh, for when it comes to requesting time be allocated to working on this, um, it can be looked at as a little bit of an indulg indulgence. Um, what would you suggest as some maybe priorities to focus on? Um, when looking at implementing some of these things? Uh, for the most part, the, the framework should be supplying 90% of the animation and the richness in the UI. Um, what we're asking people to do is actually look at some of the new APIs for um, shared element transitions between activities. Like, there, there are moments that make good places for uh, polish and, and brand in your app. Um, so using the core elements, using the core iconography, using the theming to make it feel like it's your product, uh, but then just Polishing one or two really critical things usually has the best out, best outcome. Yeah, and the uh, Polymer framework is actually going to be really great for all kinds of different platforms, you know, mm -hmm. mobile platforms. So. Yeah, and part of the reason our, we've done this for platform. ourselves, it's it's helpful for us to be able to have, uh, if we do a mobile web app and a native app, to, to create a very similar structure there so we don't have different interaction designers thinking about different ways of handling it. They, they should be treated as pretty much the same app. With small, uh, it's with probably, small adjustments. It's probably a good opportunity to also mention that uh, after this, we're actually going to go, uh, some of us are going to be in the design sandbox on level two. And um, as part of releasing our spec and design and having all this um, you know, announced, uh, we really want to talk to designers and developers about kind of the problems they have in terms of what they're trying to solve for their users. And, 
and, and so that we can understand um, how, how material design and the principles here can help support that, or, or you know, maybe, maybe there's some unique problems out there that, that you know, need a little bit of a different twist, and we'd love to, we'd love to hear feedback about that. Um, cool. Thanks. Hey there. Um, I'm Peter. I'm a UX UI designer, and my question is regarding animations. For one, as you all know, animations are something kind of make an app pop and stand out. And recently, we had a lot of trouble where, like, I work in design agencies and stuff. So where we make an app, we create animations either in fireworks, uh, After Effects, um, origami, or we just we just animate them manually. And I was wondering if is there going to be a tool from Google that will help us kind of animate our <laughs> design? Because that's the hardest part of transferring it to a developer, explaining to them how it's going to interact. And will there be an addition to the design guidelines explaining what kind of default animations you should focus on? What kind of will there be like more of a sandbox that designers can use so they can kind of carry their points across to the developers? Because I, I usually find that point where you kind of transfer all of your work to the developers that's the toughest bit. And if a tool were there, like a native tool that would help us aid in th that process, that would be great. But do you have any tips for that? And is there anything planned on kind of like improving that? So, so even before the tool, one of the things that we've noticed as, as we've been doing that same process and designing things and working with engineering to, to make them happen is that having that shared metaphor and having engineering kind of understand those same principles gets us a lot closer um, from the very beginning that we, we, we kind of know how things should move and how things should react. Um, and and I, I think that's a, a, a good place to start. I don't know if anybody else wants to comment. It's that. also helped us to, we actually define a number of different animation curves. Like we're not using just sort of simple ease in and ease out. Um, but we got those sort of built in and worked with the engineers so they understood those. And we tend to use them everywhere and then we iterate on them as needed. Um, so tools aside, like we found it just helpful to stay in constant communication with the engineers uh, and, and try to get as much of this stuff baked in as logic into the system rather than like as things that we're handing over that are one-offs. Okay. And uh, what's your standard design process for like explaining it to the developers? It's just like a case of them sitting near you and you kind of cover the entire animation process with them together. How do you get like the point across to them? Uh, it's fairly ad hoc, depends on the situation. Right. Like it's sitting, sitting together is always the best way to yeah. accomplish anything. Okay, I was just wondering if you have a standardized process for that. All right, cool, thanks. Yeah. I, I do wanna uh, mention be before you walk away that uh, that's a, that kind of request or, or interest in tools or anything like that, we don't have any tools to announce today, but um, that's the kind of feedback and uh, pain point that you guys are feeling that we'd love to hear about more so we know how to focus our energy. And you know, if you guys have more of those kinds of questions or uh, requests, come by the Design Sandbox. <laughs> One follow-up. Uh, where's the design box? Sorry. Uh, it's the second floor. Second. Uh, it's design. It's over by um, the distribute section. It's kind of like you look for the YouTube oh, so sign. Yeah, the yeah, YouTube. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's by the YouTube booth. That's right. It's very clear design. Yeah. So, so my question is really about color, and you know, I see a lot of bright colors these days everywhere. And uh, you know, even in the pictures there, some of you have a purple background and a red, and so very bright colors, and they're all different combinations. So, so how do you pick these bright color combinations in context of you know material design, without so that it's not uh, so it is actually appealing to the user, and so it's it has meaning, and it's, it's not bright enough to you know. Uh, um, yeah, be noisy or we, something. We, we yeah. test 41 shades. Yeah. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> well, I, Not I, funny. I think it's actually, it's actually too soon. Just kidding. Sorry, there's too soon. Two, there's too two soon. approaches to color. Um, one is that we intentionally wanted to take a very um, exuberant approach to applying color to our applications. Um, we, we felt that, like I was kind of talking about some of the slides where you should really embrace your brand's product colors or your icon colors and extend those things all the way through all the, the, the series of screens that someone's going to see. Um, and so we thought, why not push it further? Um, and on the reverse side, I think there's also some pretty extensive um, usability and contrast ratio studies that we've started to standardize around. And I think that that's the intention of the design uh, guidelines is to kind of help give guidance on being exuberant while still being uh, accessible and usable. 
Yeah, so to be super clear, uh, if you go into the spec, you will find a whole bunch of palettes, and they have a lot of guidance on what kinds of uh, colors you should put together in order to get legible text on top of them and stuff like that. Um, but uh, we are very much in love with and excited with these, these modern bold colors, but the entire system is designed to let different you know, approaches and philosophies to color feel just as much at home. If you want your content to pop more and your UI elements to be really muted and subdued, um, you know, that's part of material design as well. The idea is that it is a material like paper and you can print something that's very exuberant on it or you can print something that's much more muted. Um, we want it to be a framework where any brand can fully express itself and feel at home and not be overshadowed by the platform's conventions. Uh, some of the th some of the examples you actually can look at in the, the, the preview um, will be like the settings app is, is quite muted. It's intended to be very utilitarian. Calculator app is also muted, but it uses a single pop of color to draw attention to other functionality. So it's again about management of what of where you want attention and, and color uh, that makes an app really unique. Um, one other point too, uh, the, the palette library that we've been working on, one of the reasons we were so excited about it was it allows you to select colors that can go alongside imagery that allow the image to feel like it is uh, covering the entire surface rather than like an arbitrarily co chosen color that may contrast in some unusual way. So you, uh, you have the opportunity to have it extend the image outwards into, into the system or even to contrast with that image if you want to draw attention to an action. It looks like we only have three minutes, three minutes and left. four questions left, yeah. so let's try right. to get through gonna, them super quick. Try to be four I'm questions sorry to minutes. take the time, but actually I have two questions, oh, and five. it's tough. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, the, the first crowd of all, will vote on which one we answer. No, just joking. Okay. Go ahead. Oh. First of all, I heard uh, Jonathan is working for UXA, which is the Google uh, defined guidelines for the Google apps. So would you like to talk about that a little bit? How would you work across different apps to make the UX guideline consistent across across Google Apps and um, how you also make sure all the apps will follow the guidelines when you did that. That's the first question. And the uh, second question was, um, Google always have a big push on the left navigations. As a company, we did follow that rule, and unfortunately, what we happened, what happened was um, right after our release from main screen navigation to the left navigation, we did see a lot of drop for the user engagement, and also we see a big trend that for Facebook uh, app and Google Plus, they changed from left navigation into the main screen navigation. So, do you guys like to share some insights of that change and how that will lead into? to a lot of companies that develop social apps that could get insights from this. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll answer right. the second question answer first. Second Super question. quick. Second um, left nav is appropriate for certain classes of apps. Um, the places we've seen the most successful is when it's something like Gmail or a, a stream of content where like 90% of your time is spent there. Uh, and the rest of the time, you need sometimes access to uh, other labels or things like that. Um, we'll go a lot more into this in interaction design tomorrow morning, but like, left nav is only one of a number of different top level constructions. You can have tabs, you can have the content area itself act as overall navigation. Um, we're, we're, one of the things we are trying to do in the guidelines is very specifically calling out the benefits of each of those different ones. Left nav, nav itself is inherently bad, but when it's used for the wrong type of application, it can, just, it can focus the user in the wrong way. And uh, I'll answer the question, how do we coordinate design across Google? We all talk to each other all the time. That's it. We go out, we just, that's it. We just Lots talk drinking. To all the time, just uh, talking. All right, next question. I, drinking uh, and talking. Yeah. I was thinking about the, all the materiality and the physicality that you traced out in the, in the paper metaphor. And I was thinking about Facebook's paper app. And they go a step further, giving, giving away all buttons and making the, interaction, the, um, the motion the clue to the interaction like to close something, and I wanted to know what you think of this. If you think that this app would feel right in uh, in the next uh, generation of uh, Android apps, or uh, we love and using motion as an affordance for things that can happen. We need to be careful about being too reliant on it because there may be people who can't perceive it. But uh, it is a wonderful way to give clues as to gestures that can be taken, um, and even just to simplify the way the UI looks through it. So we're yeah, excited you, about this. You can the see in our, in our ca uh, calculator app, we have uh, a side panel of expanded options. There's no button for it. There's no little textured drag handle. 
It's just a surface. And you close it by, and you go close it by sliding twice. Yes. Okay. All right. We take one more question. Oh no! Come on. Let's this one. Sorry, they're telling us to go. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering cool. if these design principles also apply to Google Glass. To Google Glass? Oh, will the design uh, principles also apply to Google Glass? As of right now, our design principles don't cover Google Glass. The, the, the information about color and brand and iconography yeah. definitely do, and we're we working very closely with that team. Um, our primary focus for now has been sort of the, the watch to television form factors, um, but we're definitely considering it and working to tie them together. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.